thanks very much for inviting me here and I'm going to try and tell you a little bit different, uh, a few different things about the way the gut and the brain are related. So first of all about the gut. The gut doesn't know what you're going to eat. So it, I've got this right, sorry. So it receives many, many things, including uh, pathogens that come with the food, the food itself, different compositions of nutrition, uh, and it has to learn from that. So it, in its lumen, has hundreds of different molecules. It has to be hyper vigilant to that, so it's always there, ready to receive information, and it has to communicate that information to the brain. Uh, through the nervous system, it communicates. It communicates through hormones, through the immune system, and it has to adapt to what's in the gut. And it does that over short and long times. The gut makes way for the brain during evolution. Now look at these graphs. This is the observed ratio of different body organs in humans, and this is what you would expect if a human was the same as a large primate to which it's related. Look how much more brain there is in the human, and what suffers, if you like, is the gut. So human beings like us have very much reduced gastrointestinal tracts. Our gastrointestinal tracts are about half what we would expect them to be um, if we were a primate of the same size. So our gut and the brain are related to evolution. Other organs, such as liver, kidney and heart, are much the same in proportion uh, to body size. So we're different and we evolved differently. This is a history of changes in human nutrition. From the time of early pre-humans, something like two and a half million years before the present, humans and the human <coughs> uh, ancestors began the non-thermal preparation of food. It wasn't till relatively recently, in evolutionary time that is, that we started cooking. And cooking dates from about half a million years ago. And we adapted, our, our digestive systems, our brains, our body adapted uh, to cooked food. And then very recently, we changed our diets. Cereals were introduced into the human diet in large amounts uh, approximately 10,000 years ago. Uh, milk. Uh, adult consumption of milk is about 8,000 years ago. And so this is very recent and truly modern foods, foods that are high in fat, are cooked at high temperature, has it been introduced in large amounts into our diet only in the last 50 years ago. So if this period of here was a day, then the highly processed modern foods appear in the last 10 to 20 minutes. So you can see that we have a challenge of adaptation, and we really do. So let's move on from there. So how have humans adapted? How have they become different uh, in terms of the gut-brain relationship, and particularly the, the way in which the gut, gut works? This is a simple picture. Uh, on this pink line, all these names refer to great apes and we're relating the area of the teeth to the bite force so how hard you can crunch things this is humans and human uh, ancestors so for a particular size of tooth we can exert much less pressure so humans are maladapted to eating hard foods. But what we have adapted to is the introduction of processed foods. What this shows is wheat burgle. This is wheat burgle from a cave in the Galilee Basin and this was 
taken from a cave where it had been preserved in the dry, and this is 23,000 year old wheat burgle. This is 30 year old wheat burgle uh, purchased uh, in Jerusalem in 1980. So you can see that the adaptation to these foods uh, has, has been over a long period of time. And in that period of time, we can evolve. We can change the digestive enzymes, we can change digestive mechanisms. So we have adapted to cereals, we've adapted to drinking milk as adults, and we have adapted to other food changes, alcohol for example. But what about modern foods? Can we adapt? So this is truly modern food. Um, <laughs> this is some sort of deep fried stuff. I'm not exactly quite sure what it was, but the picture illustrates it. This used to be chicken, and now it's this funny brown thing. This is a Mars bar, much favoured in Scotland, I understand, uh, in this form. Here's flame grilled steak, and here's some nice fried cookies. So how do, can we imagine that our gut and our brain uh, can adapt to this food? Well, we can't adequately. There's even other uh, interesting examples of great examples of modern food. Um, so if you have a quick look around here, you can see deep fried butter balls uh, on sale at your local supermarket, even deep fried coffee, deep fried chocolate bacon on a stick, <laughs> Deep fried Oreo cookies, Twinkies, and I can't quite read that from here, uh, Snickers, and you can get deluxe versions of these with added ice cream and chocolate to make it really good. But this is a serious business. We are now taking uh, this sort of food, and we've only taken it in copious amounts in the last 50 years. So it's doing a lot to our behaviour but it's also doing stuff to our body. So, this is what happens to your liver. The incidence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, cyanohepatitis, has increased dramatically in the last 50 years to the extent that people in Western countries approaching 50% of middle-aged people have converted their liver from this to this. So that's where we are at, uh, in modern times. So humans actually, I've, I've taken you through a little bit of the history of eating. Humans are cuchinivals. They are dedicated to the consumption of processed food. Unless humans are able to provide the energy density they need to run the brain with a lesser amount of food, and a more concentrated food, because they've reduced, we've reduced our size of gut, we wouldn't survive. So our large brains and our reduced guts means that we do rely on prepared foods. And we can adapt, and we have adapted, to the uh, dietary changes over a period of thousands of years. But we can't adapt over a period of tens of years. So. The gut, what is happening in our gut is linked to what's happening in our brain, both in an evolutionary sense and in a modern disease sense. So, thank you, Kuchinivores, <laughs> from the, our work at Melbourne University and the Flory.